Okay, welcome back. This is uh, Issues in Biotechnology, the way we work with life, and this is part two for medical biotechnology. In part one, we looked at some historical uh, developments in terms of um, biomedical devices and how that led up to current advances in tissue engineering, especially stem cells and genetic engineering. And now we want to look at um, applications that led up to gene therapy, what its concepts are and its applications and what its um, downsides have been and its challenges. And then we will touch on tissue engineering and finally uh, the uses of nanotechnology. If you knew your sibling had a fatal genetic disease that was degenerative, such as Parkinson's, would you allow the sacrifice of a five-day-old human embryo from an IVF clinic in order to generate the stem cells required to save their life? That is the dilemma that I think surrounds the controversies about embryonic stem cells. And we looked in the last set of lectures about how this could be overcome by applications of adult stem cells. We examined what are embryonic stem cells by definition and the history behind the development and therapeutic applications of adult stem cells including that they've been used to treat leukemia for many years. We also touched on the ability to genetically engineer stem cells and how this also coincides in parallel with the ability to clone animals and genetically engineer animals. So in gene therapy, the notion set out right away was using genes therapeutically to prevent or treat disease. This could be accomplished by either replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy or inactivating, knocking out a mutant gene or introducing a new gene to replace a defective one. So this would be an approach to treating disease by either modifying the expression of an individual's genes or the correction of abnormal ones. Keep in mind that this could occur in various different ways. So by administration of DNA, rather than a drug, coincident with cellular pharmaceuticals, many different diseases could be currently treated uh, or investigated as candidates for gene therapy. The notion is rather simple to explain. You have a mutant gene which causes a degenerative disorder. This could be replaced or augmented. The first successful gene therapy on humans was accomplished in 1990 by Drs. French Anderson uh, Michael Belize and Ken Culver, researchers uh, working for the NIH. So the then four-year-old uh, that was treated for ADA, which is a Denison deaminase deficiency, is a rare genetic disease in which children are born with severe immunodeficiency and are prone to repeated serious infection. A defect in ADA causes the severe combined immunodeficiency disorder and has been a target in gene therapy owing to its simplicity but also the severity of the disease. I think its simplicity is uh, really why it has drawn attention as a model here, not certainly the number of people that are affected. But actually, the notion of gene therapy can be implemented in several different ways. For example, uh, you could introduce a gene which would be transiently expressed, 
What I mean by that is DNA can be introduced into a cell, which would then be transcribed into its RNA and translated into its protein, but never stably integrated into its genome. By this way, you are making a foreign protein without stable genetic modification. And I'll show you in a minute what kinds of applications this type of therapy could have. One of those, in fact, is listed here as DNA vaccines. We had already gone through vaccine development in the previous lecture, looking at how we could use attenuated viruses, uh, killed viruses, and so on. And we did mention the development of DNA vaccines. Say, for example, you had a DNA sequence which would code for a coat protein on a virus for a pathogen. Without attenuating that virus, simply knowing the sequence for that coat protein, that DNA sequence could be injected or blasted into a cell. It would be transcribed, the foreign protein would be made, and it would mount an immune reaction. So therefore, it would diminish both time of development and any exposure which might occur from a less than killed virus in a, a, a standard application. Then we'll talk about targeted gene therapy and lastly, germline transformation. So there's germline transformation and um, targeted therapy that I'll save for later. But the point is, is that an introduced foreign gene, whether that's in a plant cell or an animal cell that makes uh, vaccines or therapeutic drugs, or in this case, replacing a gene, an introduced foreign gene is going to be transcribed into RNA and translated into a protein just like any other gene. It doesn't matter even the source of that gene. If it's from you, I can put it into him. No problem. DNA is DNA. The genetic code is the same. We've seen this now reiterated in the other applications in biotechnology. So a foreign gene will produce a new protein which will confer the benefits of uh, that gene and its expression whether it is in integrated stably into the genome or not. So transient expression might be an application for, say, cystic fibrosis, which is a problem with epithelial cells in the lung. And would it be possible to aerosol deliver the correct gene through liposomes, which could fuse with those cells, transiently express the correct protein, and then by reapplication, once those cells sloughed off, uh, similarly replenish and diminish the symptomology. You can think of lots of other examples that could be treated that way. <coughs> so transient expression, introducing DNA that doesn't integrate it doesn't even have to strictly be in the nucleus as long as the RNA polymerase and other machinery is present to transcribe it into RNA and then eventually into protein. You can do dramatic examples of this by, say, putting foreign proteins onto gold particles and using a gene gun to shoot them into cells in plants and animals with reporter genes like green fluorescent protein or GUS and observing the transient expression of those spots. Typically, those proteins will go away after they have eclipsed their half-life, uh, but uh, certainly for a specific amount of time, those proteins are active and that's easily demonstrable. So you can think of antibody therapies, uh, sort of passive immunity that might be an application this way, protein-based drugs that could be made in a transient way and delivered directly to tissues, cells, or organs. 
We could conduct biochemical pathway manipulations by either uh, introducing pathway antagonists, blocking pathways, or enhancing certain steps in pathways in certain cells. I mentioned previously the idea of RNAi, uh, interfering RNAs, short RNAs that would silence gene expression by preventing their expression. Could you deliver genes which encode RNAis? So delivering foreign DNA, which is transiently expressed to make an RNAi that then acts therapeutically. This may be one of its best promises. And lastly, vaccines. As I've already described, you could make a DNA against a protein for a pathogen as an antigen that would mount an immune response and then function as a vaccine in a lasting memory. Okay, targeted gene therapy. The idea being that there might be a deficient gene uh, or a defective mutant gene that you could replace. So to reverse disease caused by genetic damage, whether that's inherited genetic damage or induced genetic damage, uh, researchers could isolate normal DNA, package it into some vector that would deliver that payload into its target cell, and um, typically these vectors are made or designed from disabled viruses. I had brought up the example previously that a disabled HIV vector might be the best approach to targeting T cells. HIV sees T cells. Maybe we could disable HIV to put in a suicide agent that would cure HIV. This is not a bad idea. And there are groups that are researching that as well as using other types of viruses that could be disabled that would target specific cell types. So a vector where its genes now have been deleted and implanted in the middle of that is the gene of interest in which you want to use as a payload to delivery. So it's a cell-specific delivery agent. How does gene therapy work? Well, the introduction of a sequence of DNA into cells could be used to compensate for abnormal genes to make a beneficial protein. It could be done by naked DNA delivery, liposomes for cystic fibrosis, or shooting naked DNA on particles by the gene gun, viral vectors or non-carrier systems that are non-viral, such as liposomes, uh, bubbles of lipid that would fuse with the membrane to deliver its payload. So foreign DNA could be delivered in vivo uh, or to patient cells ex vivo, and those cells could be implanted, and we already went over that sort of application for stem cells. But the idea is diagrammed here, where the red gene uh, is defective in its nucleus, and you could, by gene addition, add a gene that in the upper one is integrated stably and perhaps under the direction of another promoter, uh, whereas the other one demonstrates uh, transient expression, so it's not stably integrated. So you might ask, at this point, Dr. Kausch, that seems so simple. Why aren't we just doing this all over the place? If in the 1990s this was first demonstrated, and there was such enthusiasm when this just first happened, we could be curing diseases all over the place. Type 1 diabetes was on the doorstep. I mean, lots of other things. What's been the hang-up? And certainly there have been a lot of them. Um, notably, Treatments for um, SCID. A trial went wrong and a patient died, largely due to viral overload, I think is the explanation. Dosage, delivery, accuracy, um, direction of integration of that gene. 
turns out that these are all flies in the ointment that still need to be worked out. Theoretically, I believe that uh, the approach is sound. So, um, again, this might be a matter of elbow grease. I don't think gene therapy is off the table. Vectors for gene therapy are continually being developed. Um, so adenoviruses, adeno-associated viruses, and so on are being engineered uh, to deliver foreign DNA. So these kinds of vectors could be developed that may see cancer cells specifically. And this might be a way to deliver suicide genetic elements uh, that would inhibit RNA, dissolve RNA like RNases, uh, or RNA inhibiting factors like RNAi. So viruses then could be the ultimate gene delivery agent and you can actually imagine that we could genetically modify viruses specifically to be cell specific. Recognizing specific uh, epitopes on cells and receptors that um, would result in delivery specific, cell specifically. So here are some candidate genetic diseases for gene therapy. I already mentioned uh, the defect caused by ADA, but hemophilia, uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, MS, uh, all of these are uh, single genes that could be targeted. Certain oncogenic factors which cause cancer, uh, high number of incidents, uh, neurologic diseases, cardiovascular disease, uh, all of these are possible targets for gene therapy and you can see that this would result in an application which should have low or no side effects in comparison to small molecule drugs. Doug Melton, as I already mentioned from Harvard, is uh, and his group have achieved uh, what many have long considered an impossibility and used differentiation of one cell type into another in an approach for cell-specific gene therapy coupled with stem cells. So again, here we come back to this idea. Should we genetically engineer humans? We already brought up and laid the foundation that this is certainly possible in animals that are non-human. We will discuss in a subsequent letter, le lecture cancer biology uh, and some of the articulate techniques and technologies that are emerging for treatment. Realize, first of all, before we even get to that lecture, cancer is not one disease. It's many diseases, really, uh, that are all lumped together to say cancer, and certainly they have a lot in common, we can do that, but genetically there are many different genes that are involved uh, in many different cell types and many organs and age and so on. So um, cancer biology itself, when people say, why haven't we cured cancer? Well, some ultimately are pretty close to that. Uh, other ones are more intractable. But uh, certainly, you look at the applications of gene therapy and stem cell therapy as coming together as a possibility for approaching um, cancer treatments that would be cell-specific and targeted. That's the point. And we'll get into cancer basics uh, when we approach that specific to target topic. So ultimately, the promise of gene therapy is directed towards these cell-specific um, carriers. The issues that remain include that viral ve vectors may alter more than the intended cell type. If gene integration is not targeted specifically but random, you could disrupt other cell functions. So the gene could be inserted in the wrong location. And what about inheritable changes? Do we want to do that? Could we start targeting developing sperm or egg for germline transformation? 
So what are the ethical arguments um, for this and for stem cell research? Uh, these haven't really gone away since the Bush administration banned federal funding on stem cells in August of 2001. And they're laid out here in this slide uh, on the National Bioethics Advisory Commission already many years old, but still, I think, with us now. On the good side, life-saving potential. On the bad side, um, the value of a human embryo or human cells. Ultimately, though, I think that as these treatments, however controversial, prove useful, uh, we or someone else in the world will apply them. And this will hold true for virtually every controversial topic we will encounter in the applications of biotechnology. You think it's controversial? Somebody won't. If it's useful, they'll do it. And if they do it, and you see that it's useful, you'll end up doing it too, or else they'll take advantage of that situation. That comes right from guns, germs, and steel. <clears throat> Moving on, there are other applications of cell biology now uh, that are also interfacing with DNA technologies. Tissue engineering. I mentioned at the outset the ability to make artificial uh, epidermis for burn victims, um, but certainly the ability to grow cells in culture uh, has been around since 1905 or so and is accelerating rapidly the more we know about stem cells, but also tissue and cell culture. Um, I would say animal cell culture has largely been inhibited over the years by the lack of defined media. They should take note here of plant cell people who have defined media down to parts per million of most additives. Animal cell culture people have relied on less defined factors such as fetal calf serum and so on. Uh, wouldn't it be better to know the exact molecular constituents which control development of the cells they're wanting to engineer. So this has been actually going on for quite a while and um, I think we can see that the development not only of tissues and organs but also biomaterials. Uh, Bio-inspired materials will become important um, for uh, not only use biomedically, but their applications outside of medicine. We know that biomimetics has become an increasingly important function. Where did your Velcro come from? Except for some guy that looked how a burr stuck to his socks. Do you know this story? So a burr stuck to his socks and he looked at those things that had kind of hooks on their ends and he said, I can make something like that out of plastic. So a biomimetic and now we have Velcro, which turns out to be very useful. <clears throat> Similarly, I think using biomimetics will help in tissue engineering. As far back as uh, year 2000, we see the engineering of artificial thymus cells, artificial bone and engineering of bone, and there's been a uh, tremendous advance in uh, the development of artificial teeth. So teeth might be one of the first artificial uh, whole uh, tissues like this that become explanted. Artificial blood has been um, a holy grail for quite some time. We all are familiar with um, blood donors and um, blood banks and so on that we can donate our blood uh, for the purpose of donors. Wouldn't it be a whole lot better if we could just create it artificially? And it wouldn't seem that hard, would it? Uh, we would know the constituents, but actually it turns out that um, this thing is a real bear. 
If you could make it, it would be a lucrative business, that's for sure, and save millions of lives. So get on that. Tissue engineering will be, uh, I think, accelerated by 3D uh, CAD type driven technologies, computer assisted drafting, and now 3D printing. So the growth of what seems like complicated organs and tissues, uh, including the growth of vascularization, uh, seems as though it might be approachable by now these types of technologies. So we might move away from things like artificial hearts or improve the technologies to make ones like turbine-driven nano machines or we might move back towards inclusion of cell types uh, that are modified and replenishable via the stem cell approach and an eventual tissue engineering or a combination of bionics, prosthesis, and bioengineering. Artificial skin, artificial car cartilage, and actually, I really don't like this picture of the artificial ear grown on a mouse's back that's kind of macabre, but I think it demonstrates, again, the use of xenotransplantation, and maybe I would feel differently if I needed one. In biomimetics, uh, looking at uh, compounds and other organisms uh, that have chemical constituents that might be useful for biomedical applications, such as the common skate egg case that you might find out on Narragansett Beach. Uh, your tendons have polymers which are very similar, and there are groups who've looked at these types of polymers for artificial tendons, and the incorporation of stem cells into um, these <coughs> cross-linked um, materials to make an artificial tendon. So what about xenotransplantation? I mentioned that the first application was a dog skull bone to a human skull. Well that's pretty weird, except for if you needed one and we can only imagine what may have instigated that. Oh, you know, <laughs> lost part of my head this afternoon. Do you think you might be able to do something about that? But again, organ donors, there's a long list uh, that people have to wait for, say, donation of a kidney. So if you had an ongoing replenishable non-human source, uh, this might be a good idea. So xenotransplantation then, uh, the science has been working to combat immunorejection of animal organisms by engineering out of cloned animals those proteins that are responsible uh, for recognition and then immunorejection by the human. So again, it's transgenics and animal cloning which comes back to be an important tool for xenotransplantation. So wanted pig transplants that really work. Um, xenotransplantation has been around for a long time. I mentioned the experiment of baby Fay, where a baboon heart uh, beat in her as a transplant recipient for three weeks. Pig nerve cell fibers uh, may correct spinal cord injuries someday if organ transplant immunorejection can be overcome, or a humanized pig via genetic engineering. So that was the accomplishment of the first clone pigs was towards xenotransplantation. So since then, and that was year 2002, we have seen the continuous advancement of humanized pigs. Doesn't that sound weird even to say? You said sometimes that this class uh, evokes uh, notions of science fiction, but they even use that phrase. Uh, but you can look this up. There are humanized pig cell lines. This is um, 
not even that remarkable anymore. So we can expect advances in xenotransplantation driven by its need. So and again, this comes from the uh, Russian aristocrat who tried this many years ago. So lastly, um, nanotechnology. We know, if you're not familiar with Moore's Law, Moore's Law demonstrated that the number of transistors per square unit area, transistors, do you remember what those were maybe? You can look them up historically, but uh, would reduce in size exponentially. And we've seen this with the application of computers. Computing technology has reduced transistors to microchips and processors, and the size keeps getting smaller and smaller, and this is exponential. So we can anticipate, likely, that nano-sized uh, computers will be carriers in our bloodstream. Ray Kurzweil gave a great lecture in the Honors Colloquium for the University of Rhode Island last fall, and I think it'll be posted on my website soon. I encourage you to see it or see him anytime you can. You know, he invented lots of other stuff, including uh, voice recognition software, artificial um, instruments that were really cool. Lots, oh, the list is long. So he has, I think, uh, reasonable credibility to suggest that uh, what will happen in the future is um, something to look forward to. Would we have, by this application, nano-sized 8-gig computers that are smaller than your blood cells? And think about that. The notion of being able to transmit my experience to you through either transfusion directly or some sort of other downloading. I mean directly transfer human experience. Uh, it's, it's wild to think about. Or collectively, we all have access uh, to the Google mind, the hive mind. GPS, wherever you go, there you are. You know, um, right now, I think it's a great application that when I don't know where I'm going on my way to Hartford that my car does, let alone my boat. And person-to-person -person streaming of information. Uh, health monitoring. When something goes wrong, um, a sensing situation could be invoked. So rather waiting for something obvious to go wrong, you know, cars have a an oil light, typically though when your oil light comes on it's already a bad scene, but nonetheless, uh, at least you know that, you know. And um, a temperature gauge is a little bit more appropriate, I think. But other nano devices uh, in development now, oxygen carriers, nano devices that can bind oxygen for slow release, that exceed that of the red blood cell. So slow release oxygen would have applications like you could walk across the bottom of a lake without uh, an external oxygen source, climb Mount Everest. Jet fighter applications win the Tour de France nine times or more without EPO. You know, these are all things we could ascribe to maybe in the future. Nano-sized cellular replacements, cyber people, a combination of human and non-human. Or when does it all become biologically replaceable except for the human mind? It's an interesting concept. Live forever as all parts are updatable. With up-to-date downloadable apps when appropriate. Pass all acquired information on to selected friends and relatives. I mentioned before that Facebook is obsolete. 
or as we're speaking now, technically it's not, but really, how archaic, quaint, for, for example, really. Um, I mean, that's how, I mean, really, right? Um, given what you can see, how this would develop, uh, what seems new now will only seem archaic and quaint tomorrow. And I think literally, according to Moore's law, it is exponential. Um, we tend to not think that, though. We get lulled into some complacency about technology development, which almost makes it seem linear, doesn't it? We think this happens more slowly than it actually does. Think that human population is growing exponentially. So not only does Moore's Law demonstrate that there is exponential growth in technology, but everything, not everything, many different things are growing exponentially. And it's hard to conceptualize, but things are happening a lot more quickly now than we, we, we were used to because it is now hooking up in many different applications. So I don't think any of these projections are really that much future. Thanks. <laughs>